Are these not beautiful roses up here? Jan, are you growing them or did you? <laughs> Thank you very much for bringing these this morning, Jan. <laughs> Okay, so this is in memory of Phil and Arlene. Okay, well, that's part of our announcements this morning. After church this, uh, this morning, uh, we are going to have a time of fellowship in memory of uh, Phil and Arlene Scriver. And uh, we'll do this after church. Uh, we've got refreshments in the back. We'll share around noon. Uh, give time. Uh, there's some people that are planning to come from uh, that aren't regular members here, and so we want to give them the opportunity to get here. So right around noon, we'll we'll be sharing, but we have refreshments and all in the back as well. So uh, we'll be doing that this afternoon, or after church. Um, in our prayer needs this morning, uh, I just want to focus on uh, the Ukraine this morning. And uh, there's a... a an academy, I guess you'd call it. It's it's called the Master's Academy. It's a, a teaching uh, college for pastors in Ukraine, and uh, they have managed to put literally uh, dozens upon dozens of uh, pastors in the field, as well as elders and other leaders in their churches, and uh, they represent a number of. of, of Christian churches in, in Ukraine. And the neat thing is, is that the leaders of the academy as well as these pastors have all chosen to stay. And uh, they just uh, request that we would be praying for them uh, as they go through this time. Uh, and uh, many of them have uh, lost their churches uh, as far as the facilities go, but the, the people are the church and the people are still meeting together and so church is continuing, and uh, I'm just impressed and, and, and blessed by some of the testimonies that I've heard, uh, so I just want to encourage you to keep the, 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 the Christian mission, if you will, in Ukraine open and, 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 and just prospering, and uh, it's, it's sad, but in one context, all the difficult things that are going on, but the other side of it is that it it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity to preach Christ. And uh, the interesting thing is, and there was an, uh, just a slight, uh, just a light little blurb about it, was some of the uh, people that have had an opportunity to witness to Russian soldiers. So uh, you never know what God's going to do in the midst of turmoil. And so uh, I just want you to, to join me in prayer with, uh, for this this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we come this morning, first off, to thank you for your mercy and your grace, your salvation that you have lavished upon us, abundant and free. Thank you, Lord. We thank you for the cross and what you have done for us. We ask, Lord, that you would cause us to rest with confidence and the grace that you pour out on us. And Father, also, we want to, to bring the church in Ukraine to you, and not just Ukraine, but in the surrounding areas, and for that matter, the, the church in Russia and China and other places where it's persecuted. Uh, we come to you and ask, Lord, that you would uh, bless these pastors, and leaders, and teachers, and and. Uh, just cause them to be blessed in so many ways. Meet their needs at every turn, Lord. And even those congregations that have lost their facilities, as they continue to meet, bless them and, and protect them. And we ask, Lord, that your word would go out with power in the sense of, of changing lives, drawing people to you in the midst of turmoil that the, the church would reach out and, and there would be a great outpouring of your spirit. And Father, we don't hesitate to pray that for our own nation. A great outpouring of your Holy Spirit. People coming to you, seeking you, coming to know you. 
We bring to you, bring this to you and ask, Lord, for you to move in our nation, our leaders, our people, our churches. We thank you, Father, for your love. We thank you, Lord, for your salvation. In Jesus' name, amen. This morning we're starting a uh, new series. It's out of Romans chapter 12. And if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12 in your your Bibles, uh, you can, uh, I'll go over some of it with you and and then uh, get it started this morning. Uh, The actual messages are going to come from uh, verses 9 through uh, 21. And uh, if you have an uh, English Standard Version, possibly some of the other versions as well, they have a heading over verse 9 that says, Marks of the True Christian, or something to that effect. And so this is what we're going to be discussing, the marks of the true Christian. Uh, And today we're going to be looking specifically at verse 9. And it's a very interesting concept that we are called to love ESV uses the word abhor, but it literally means to hate. Uh, and, and here, you know, we normally think hate is not something that we as Christians should have in our, in our being. But there are some things that we are called to hate. And uh, we're going to look at that this morning. So uh, we will look, uh, looking at chapter 12, verses uh, nine, well, just verse 9 specifically this morning, but we're also going to include verses 1 and 2 as a way of introduction. So let's pray together as we open your word. Father, as we open your word, we ask that you would open our hearts to receive. We ask, Lord, that you would move in each of us, Lord, in, in the areas that we need to grow in you. And we know that your word can move mightily in, in so many different people in so many different ways, even though it's the same word being preached because of where we are in our walk with you. We ask that you would meet us, Lord, in our needs. In Jesus' name, amen. So, chapter 12, let's read uh, verses 1 and 2 first. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to you, to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Drop down to verse 9. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit. Serve the Lord. Rejoice in hope. Be patient in tribulation. Be constant in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Powerful words. This morning, as we look at this, like I said, I want to look at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12 as a form of introduction to this uh, series. Uh, the first thing that we're told to do in, in chapter 12, verse 1, is to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. The idea of living sacrifices means present ourselves, our being, 
who we are, our soul, our inner being as well, our whole being, if you will, to God as a living sacrifice. What that means is we present ourselves to God if we give it as a sacrifice means we are surrendering to God and accepting him as our master. He has ownership over us. He owns us. He is in control. He is sovereign over our lives. We belong to Him. Paul says this is a holy and acceptable thing to do. Uh, Holy means to be set apart. In other words, we are no longer part of the world. We have been set apart to serve God and to worship Him and Him alone. Acceptable means well-pleasing. We, it's, an, it's a pleasing thing to God for us to do this. So holy and acceptable to God. And then he says, which is your spiritual worship? Uh, the idea of spiritual here is, is it's, the, it's, it's an interesting thing. It's the logical thing to do if you look at, the, at this all together. It's the logical thing to do. It's a reasonable thing to do. And to do it with heart, soul, and mind is implied. Spiritual worship, heart, soul, and mind. And so it's a reasonable thing to do in the praising of God. And so we add that idea of praising God. Spiritual worship, the reasonable thing to do in praising God. He goes on in verse 2. Do not be conformed, but be transformed. Don't be conformed to this world. And, and, and to the, the idea of the world here is to the age that we are in. It's always that context. So the age that they were in at that time, the age that we're in at this time. The things that go around in the world that are striving and driving to get our attention and pull us apart from God. We're saying we are a holy, acceptable sacrifice, and so we're separated for God, and the things of this world are trying to pull us back the other way. And so beware of this. Don't be conformed. Don't be made like the world. Don't think that, oh, you know, I've got to, if I'm going to be a part of this uh, culture, I have to do this, 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 and this. No, we are part of God's culture. We are in the kingdom of God. We're not... Well, we, you know, we, we are to call to be good citizens and all those things in as much as it does not conflict with our relationship with God. And so this idea of, of being not conformed to the world is, is important for us to grasp. Uh, I put here, don't, don't, uh, do not allow my mind or my character to be fashioned, drawn into, and what are the things that, that, of the world that, that, that compete, you know, that, that start to draw our ideas? Well, I, I'm, and I'm careful how I do this. I have more than one television in my home. So I confess that, that if that's a problem with anybody. Uh, the, the idea is, is that TV, though, is something that needs to be wash, watched with discretion. Because it's, it, it wants us to do what? Conform to the world. All the advertisement says in order to conform, you need to smell like this, look like this, to, you know, eat like this, whatever, dress like this, and and so the idea is is that we need to to view everything with eyes that are discerning, so that we will not be drawn away from God and conform to the world, made like. The world, either in our mind or in our character. Uh, in fact, instead of being conformed to the world, we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now, this idea of transformed is, is an interesting word all by itself. How many of you are familiar with the idea of metamorphosis? 
You know, you, you polywogs, metamorphous frogs, okay? That's the easiest way to, for me to describe it. That's, that's a form of metamorphosis. God is in the process. We are, we are to be transformed, not changed. We are to be transformed. We're to be made in some, into something different than we started. Now, we may look the same, but we're no longer thinking the same. What's being transformed? Our minds. The process by which we receive information and, 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 and discern and look at the world, our minds are what are being transformed, our understanding, the way we look at things. This word uh, renewing is an interesting word all by itself. I'm not going to give you a full word study on it, but it means a complete change ultimately. I no longer think like this. I now think like this, okay? And, and I'll give you a couple examples in a few minutes, but this idea of transformed is... is uh, <laughs> I, I thought this was interesting because this is, I am not a Greek scholar. Understand that. But I, I have some wonderful tools that help me. And one of the translations for this is, is up-newing. Moving up and renewing, in other words. Up-newing. I found that as an interesting compound word. Okay? For the better. A complete change. Changing the way we understand the world around us. That's what God is wanting to do in us. He's wanting to change how we view the world around us. We are to test and discern what is the will of God. Testing, discerning is, is the idea of to recognize as genuine uh, by examination. We are to look at something and, and say, is this something that, that God would bless or that God would, would, would push away? This is what we, how we are to look at the things of the world. How, is, God going, is this something God would bless? And we want to be so careful because people will turn around and say, well, you know, uh, anything that, that, that sins needs to be pushed away. We, we, we as Christians... We hate sin, but what? Love the sinner. Okay, so don't get those things confused. We're not trying to isolate ourselves, pull away from the world. We're in it, but not of it. Okay? But this idea of testing and discerning is simply to recognize, as we look around, what is of God and what is not. Where God would bless and where God would have us pull back. I was writing down here what the will of God is. I don't know how many times in my life I have personally said, Lord, what is your will in this particular situation? Uh, should I do this or should I do that? Should I go to Bible college or should I not? You know, all these kinds of things that you do. And, and this is what God wants us to do. He wants us to look and and. and really examine the things around us and see if this is what God would have us do. And God confirms or, or, or pulls you away one way or the other uh, in so many ways through advice of, of, of older, mature Christians who have been through uh, life and, and, and have much to offer, uh, through your pastors, through your, church, your elders, through, through your family, it, there's so many ways that God can confirm and, and cause you to see this is what we are to do. And, uh, and, and there are certain things he'll do to give you the, the encouragement to let you know this is the, this is the thing, this is, this is the right thing to do. I know that when Kathy and I decided to go to Bible college, we decided, oh, so, uh, probably close to a, a, a year before we actually went because we, were, we got to go to a conference at the Bible college and we, whoa, this is amazing. 
and and we we just were we were excited about it. And we prayed and prayed and prayed, and we both came up with separately to that conclusion that we felt God was calling us to San Jose to go to Bible college. And so we started looking into it, and we found out we couldn't afford to live in San Jose. That was right in the midst of the the boom of all the uh, computer uh, stuff, and 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 uh, we houses were were not being built fast enough, and the rent was outrageous. And we looked at it, and you know, and and we said, I guess we can't go if we can't afford. Well, if God would provide for us. And we didn't necessarily put it out like a fleece. We just said, if God could provide for us a place, we, we would be able to go. A couple of days later, we get a phone call from the college. By the way, we have a house that we own uh, right next to this college, and, and we, we were looking for somebody to rent it to. We know you're a family wanting to come here, and, and we have kids. Well, we, not only that, my wife was pregnant, and... It, with uh, our second child. And he says, so we'd like to know if you would be interested in renting it. How much? $250 a month. Huh? <laughs> you know, I said, sold. And, and uh, God provided. The day, we, moved, we, the day we, we left to go to Bible college, we went to say goodbye to our pastor at his church. And on the way home, uh, on the way back to the house, where, uh, our house, the, the, there was literally an explosion underneath my car and smoke and noises. And we got out and part of the transmission was on the ground. And we're thinking, oh, now what do we do? Well, I had a 1947 Studebaker pickup and <laughs> Caddy... <laughs> <laughs> oh, stupid baker. Okay, uh, that, that comes from the fact that when you have a part that you need on it, you cannot go to the store and just buy it. It has to be rebuilt, reprocessed or in some way. Okay, and, and the guy at the parts house said, oh, that's a stupid baker, and my daughter adopted that and hung on to it. Uh, but 1947 Studebaker pickup, and uh, top speed, 45 miles an hour, and my, my uncle saw us going down the road on that, and Kathy pregnant, nine months, where the doctor said, know where the hospitals are on the way up. And uh, he said, he, my, my uncle said, no way, is she going up in that? So he drove her in his beautiful Crown Victoria, and, uh, and I drove my stupid baker. And, uh, you know, just, just things after, one after another. By the way, a neat thing happened. We came outside of our house one morning, and sitting in our driveway was our car and in San Jose. Nobody ever claimed who fixed it, who did what, how it got there. Nobody ever took credit for it. You see, I, I look at these things, and I'm just saying, as you're discerning, God is going to, as you get on the right track, God's going to open doors, close doors, whatever's necessary to get you to where he wants you to be, to grow you into what he wants you to become. And so we want to know the will of God. Uh, let me suggest to you, go to the word, read it, and pray. Don't, don't just sit there and say, God, is it your will whether I should do this or that? But, but get deep in his word and pray. And, and th by the way, there are certain things that we know we should be doing and maybe aren't doing. Therefore, we're violating the will of God. Okay, so do the things you know that God wants you to do and, and just pray and, and, and trust that he's going to lead. He's going to allow his, the, his good, acceptable, perfect uh, will to be accomplished. The idea of a, of a perfect will here, you know, a mature, brought to completion. Uh, and the ultimate picture is the kingdom of God and the new heavens and the new earth is, is the ultimate completion. So get down to verse 9. Let love be genuine. Let love be genuine. The word genuine here is to... 
easily is, is the easiest definition is just to say to be sincere. But again, not a Greek scholar, but using great Greek scholars' information coming to me and reading it, it literally means without hypocrisy. And the word hypocrisy comes from the Greek. When the actors used to do the Greek plays, they had masks on, on, on either they would wear them full time because their part, their, their part didn't change, or they had them on sticks because they, they played different parts. And they would put them up and back and forth or whatever. But the idea was to cover your face with a mask. In other words, to portray something that you're not. That's hypocrisy. That was what they called it. Well, today we understand hypocrisy as insincere. Being something that you're not. Okay, and that's the idea of this hub. It says, don't be that. Be genuine. Be real. Be sincere. So let's look at, it says, let love be genuine. Okay, then we need to understand what love is. And the best way to understand that is, is to understand what Jesus call, you know, said the great commandment is. What is the great commandment? Out of Matthew chapter 22. Remember what was happening. The Pharisees and the Sadducees and the Herodians were trying to trick him up. They were all asking what would be, by their definition, difficult questions. Things that they would argue at about outside the gate uh, and at the gate in the city. That's where they would gather together and debate this and debate that and whatever. And, and so they all were asking questions and Jesus was giving answers that they'd say, oh, wow, we didn't think of it that way. You know? and, and so it was beyond them. And so the Pharisees said, he's, he's getting away with this. You know, and so they came up with the toughie. What's the greatest commandment? Because there is no one single great commandment. They, that was a, and he went outside of the Ten Commandments and said, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind. Genuine. <laughs> Interesting. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And then he said, there's another one that goes with that. To love your neighbor as yourself. If, you were, if you're doing these, you're keeping the whole law. And I thought, how does, how does that keep the whole law? Look at the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments are considered really, in a sense, an index of all the laws of, uh, that, that, uh, of Leviticus. And, 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 and you look at it and, and, and you look at the Ten Commandments. The first four commandments deal with your relationship with loving your Lord, your God, with all your heart, soul, and mind. And the next six deal with how you interact with each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so that's what Jesus says. If you're doing this, you're keeping the whole thing. You're doing it. They're sitting there just kind of no argument back. How can you argue with that? It's, it's logic. It's clear. It's, it's the right thing. And we've never thought of putting it together that so let your love, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Love each other in a, in a way that, that is, is reflective of that. Love your neighbor, in other words, as yourself. This, this idea of genuine, sincere, without hypocrisy, love. So that when you, I say that I love you, you can trust that that is a sincere statement. And my lifestyle reflects that. Genuine, sincere love. Now, if you have a genuine, sincere love, the next phrase is going to be a very much a part of your life. Abhor what is evil. This idea of, of to abhor is to hate, to loathe, <laughs> to dislike, but the idea is, the emphasis is really this idea of hate and loathe, uh, evil. And what evil is, is anything that's morally objectionable in behavior to, to God and his kingdom and his word. And I, I, I had to say, to my, more, morally objectionable, anything that's morally objectionable, who decides? 
I put it back around. God's Word decides. Are there divisions over what God's Word says in, in, in some ways? Yes. But it doesn't argue about what it means to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind and love each other you know, this way. There's, there's no division over that. If there's division over that, then there, there's somebody that's not a true Christian. Okay? And so God's Word tells us, and in general, anything that interferes with the great commandment is evil. Anything that interferes with the way we love God and the way we love each other in God is something that doesn't belong to us. And there's, I hate to say it, there's only two camps. We want, we want a middle road, but there's only two camps. There's what is of God and there's what's not of God. What's not of God is evil. What of, is of God is holy. Okay? And we're told to stay on this side of the thing. I had a, a, a student in the eighth grade uh, when I was teaching uh, middle school. And uh, we were talking about this. And uh, he came to the conclusion that man invented a, the, the idea of gray, the gray in between. He says, man has invented, a, and this, this is an eighth grader, mind you, yeah, man has invented a middle road so that we can, we, we can kind of pick and choose from both sides. And, it, and it's the gray area. And then he came to the conclusion there is no gray area. It's something man's invented, but it doesn't exist. And I thought that was an amazing thing. I learned a lot from him that day. And, and I love that picture. We want a gray area. Our nature is to want to be holy, but man, we don't want to miss out on this over here from the world. And when we look at it, we think, man, God's not going to really be blessed with that. And we have to make this decision. And we have to think about it. Well, the idea is, is that we are to come to a point in our lives where we abhor what is evil. We really stand up against it. And, and uh, so the God's Word tells us what it is. I wanted to give you a couple of examples. Um, Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, I'm just going to read a little bit of it. 22, verse 22 of Ephesians chapter 4. Put off your old self. This is the process of renewing. Uh, being transformed, and renewing your mind. Put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and to put on the new self, created after a likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry, but do not sin, and do not let the sun go down on your anger. And give no opportunity to the devil. Let the, <clears throat> let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he might have something to share with anyone in need. Well, let the heater go. <laughs> Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Well, oh, I was going to ask you, Floyd, to turn it off, but <laughs> it went okay. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit by whom you were sealed, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ has forgiven you. This is the, the, the way we are to act with one another. And it's to be consistent to the point where we can rest with confidence that we are safe in this place with each other. We are, we are honest with each other. We are, we, we are genuine. We are sincere. And we have 
our first priority, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. There's another couple of verses here in, in Ephesians I want to look at. Uh, in chapter 5, it says, Be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice. Drop down to, to uh, verse 15. Look carefully then how you walk. Not as unwise, but as wise. In other words, discerning. Making the best use of the time because the days are evil. The world is evil. It wants to distract you from God. Okay? Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery. And the idea of, of getting drunk with wine here is br much broader than having a drink of, of alcohol. The idea of being drunk with wine is don't be drunk on the things of the world. Obsessed with the things of the world. But be filled with the Spirit. Addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Just to get that picture of uh, to you know, love God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and let that conquer you, own you. Let love be genuine. Abhor what is evil. Uh, by the way, the, there's a proverb. I, 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 and I'm going to go ahead and do this. I wasn't going to take the time to do it. but Proverbs uh, chapter 6. Seven things that God hates. Verse 16 of chapter 6, Proverbs. There are six things that the Lord hates, seven that are an abomination to him. Haughty eyes. People who think highly of themselves. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that devises wicked plans. Feet that make haste to run to evil a false witness who breathes out lies, and one who sows discord among brothers. In other words, someone who intentionally wants to cause division. We are told that we are to want to sing psalms together, hymns together, come together, worship together, all with, again, that same premise. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind. Be genuine in your faith. Abhor what is evil. Hold fast to what is good. And let's look quickly at that. This idea to hold fast means to cling to. To hold tight or to embrace. Hold fast to what is good. And the word good here stands for moral excellence. Again, genuine love versus abhor evil. What is good? How do you get started in this? Well, maybe this is old for some of you. Maybe it's, it's fresh for some of you. But we always need to be reminded what it is that put us on the, 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 this road to seeking the face of God and desiring to be His chosen people, his, his, to be saved, to use the, 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 the common term, to where we are able to hold fast to what is good. Well, to start, just go back a, a a little ways, two chapters in, in the book of uh, Romans, and look at chapter 10, verse 9. I don't know how many of you are familiar with what is called the Roman road, uh, but this is uh, part of it. And uh, it says, 
If you confess with your mouth uh, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The moment you confessed with your, with your mouth and you believed in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, salvation is yours. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. So how do we get started on this road? We confess with our mouth, we believe in our heart that Jesus is raised from the dead. His resurrection was real. It was a bodily resurrection. It's all implied in that. And, And the book of Romans deals with discussing that. And so when he gets to the point where he says this, he's already declared all that. And so we look at this and say, I confess, I believe. And we go on then. There's an additional thought to this. In 1 John, in the very first chapter, in verse 8, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, Jesus is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him to be a liar and his word is not in us. Oh, my little children, I am writing these things to you that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, And I put under here, I have in my own notation here, when I do sin, we have an advocate. Do you know what an advocate is? So a lot of people say, well, somebody comes alongside you, and that's an an accurate picture. But in the culture that we're dealing with here, an advocate was a lawyer. You have someone who knows the law. You have an advocate. With the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. People, you've got to understand this. God is the judge, and he judges all things. And Jesus Christ, the righteous, is our lawyer. It can't get any better than that. We have a lawyer, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. He is, he is made, at, the idea of propitiation is to make peace with someone, basically. He is the propitiation. He has made peace with God on our behalf. We were, no, we were, we were at odds with God because of sin. Now, because of Jesus Christ, as we've confessed him with, uh, uh, with our mouth and believe in our hearts, that he is the, is the Christ raised from the dead. He says, we are saved. And that idea is that propitiation, we are at peace with God. Our sins have been covered. And not, not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. And by this we know that we have come to know him. If we keep his commandments, there's a desire in our heart to change, to be transformed. We would desire now to keep his commandments. propitiation, that idea of sacrifice, completely, uh, you know, God is completely satisfied. All judgment has been taken care of. It's, a, it's an awesome word. Uh, and so this idea of transformation begins at this point of confession, desire to keep God's commandments, satisfying with great, uh, with the, looking at the great commandment and, 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 and looking at this and saying, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's my desire. And the second is like it, love the neighbor as yourself. That is my desire. And the idea is, is that no matter what somebody does to me, I still love them. That means we love our enemies. That's not of the world, let me tell you. In fact, it's not in any way of the flesh. Somebody does something to you, and the, the idea is to, to react. Okay, But this idea to love your enemy is to say, I pray for this person. 
as much as I despise what they are doing and have done, I pray for their salvation. I pray for God to intervene in their lives. When we get into communion, this is the propitiation we share in. We, we, we remember what Christ has done. How did he make peace with God for us? He died on the cross. He poured out his blood, life. Hebrews tells us that the life of man is in the blood. Jesus poured out his blood. So we have two things that we share at communion. We share a piece of bread, which Jesus himself said is, is, is a representation of his flesh. It doesn't become his flesh. It's a picture of his flesh. It's a reminder of his flesh. And by the way, it's not just the flesh that hung on the cross. It's the flesh that came into the world at birth. He humbled himself. That was a sacrifice, even at the very beginning, all the way through his life in the flesh. And then he poured out his blood on the cross. And so he shared this with his disciples. Two things that would remind us of the peace that has been purchased with God and how it was done. And he asked us as often as we would share this, we would do it in remembrance of him. So I'm going to ask uh, the, the worship team to come back up and we have a song to sing. And uh, while they're singing, uh, we have communion up here to pick up. And uh, there's two uh, ch choices. If there's one as a packet that has the bread at the top, pull the, lever, the first piece of uh, uh, covering off, and there's the bread, and then you pull the second covering off, and there's the, 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 the fruit of the vine, uh, the grape juice, and, and that's there. Or you can take the other one, which is just two cups put together, uh, one has the bread and the, and the top one has the, the cup. We're going to share the bread, bread and the cup together in, uh, as soon as they're done singing. So feel free to come up and pick one up. And uh, if someone wants to stay seated and let someone pick one up for them, that's certainly acceptable as well. So while we're singing, please. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost was slain so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a Oh, the old rugged cross, so despised by the world, has a wondrous attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left his glory above to bear it to die. In the old rugged cross, stained with blood so divine, a wondrous beauty I see. For it was on that old cross, Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. 
So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross, I will ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. Then you will call me someday to my home far away, where is glory forever. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown the book of Matthew chapter 26 verse 26 Now, as they were eating, Jesus took bread, and after blessing it, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body. Let us share in the bread. And he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us share in the cup. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. A day of celebration that we look forward to. The marriage supper, the kingdom of God, new heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem. What an awesome time we have to look forward to in our great hope in Christ. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for these emblems that remind us of the love and the mercy that you poured out on the cross. And the fact that we can come to you with confidence to claim these mercies and this, and this grace to cover us. That we know, we can rest with that confidence, that we can know, that we know, that we know we have an advocate before the throne of God in, in, in you. You are our lawyer. You are our defense. You have taken care of our sin. You are the propitiation. You have made peace with God. On our behalf. Thank you. We worship you. We praise you. And as we go, we ask, Lord, that you would go with us, that we would be a, a genuine representation of your love and your mercy and your grace to those around us. Again, we worship you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand as we close, please? Jesus, you endured my pain. Savior, you bore all my shame. All because of your love. Maker of the universe. 
broken for the sins of the earth all because of your love all because of your love because of your cross my debt is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life i freely give because of your love because of your love i live innocent and holy king you died to set the captive free all because of your love lord you gave your life for me so i will live my life for you all because of your love all because of your love because of your cross my debt is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life i freely give because of your love because of your love i live you did it for me you did it for love it's your victory jesus you are enough you did it for me you did it for love it's your victory jesus you are enough because of your cross my debt is paid because of your blood my sins are washed away now all of my life i freely give because of your love because of your love i live phil and arlene to share some remembrances of him and we'll do that in a little while we have refreshments in the back if you have time, and uh, just Lord bless, have a wonderful rest of the day.